poderoso Testificas tu no Vale. 
Invaluable es tu santidad Todo lo sustentas tú Todo lo llenas tú No hay otro como tú Si eres sobre todo Dios Inmutable es tu honor Todo lo llenas tú ¿Quién más importante que tú? Invaluable es tu santidad Todo lo sustentas tú todo lo llenas tú Todo lo llenas Con tu gloria Tu poder Nadie como tú Rey Que hace Y que declara Decreto a la creación para cumplir tus anhelos, para glorificarte, exaltado eres tú, Señor. Declara que eres santo y digno Eres excelente, magnífico Rey Detalle tuyo, intachable es tu control, proclama su majestad, el amor de Eres único, testificas que uno eres, incomparable es tu poder. Otro como tú, si eres sobre todo Dios, inmutable es tu honor, todo lo llenas tú. ¿Quién más importante que tú? Invaluable es tu santidad, todo lo sustentas tú, todo lo llenas tú. No hay otro como tú, si eres sobre todo. Todo lo llenas tú ¿Quién 
más importante que tú Invaluable es tu santidad Todo lo sustentas tú Todo lo llenas tú Señor Tuyo es el poder Tuya es la gloria siglos de los siglos tú permaneces fiel en tu poder que tú haces ver a la creación grandioso eres tú Jesús Te igual a ti Nada te igual a ti Jesús Nada te igual a En tu manera de ser En tu manera de revelar tu naturaleza eterno eres tú eterno eres tú perfectamente accionas conforme a tu naturaleza ningún otro hace o habla como tú Ni se puede semejar a ti Perfecto Dios Perfecto Rey Soberano voluntad Perfecto Perfecto eres tú, así eres de perfecto tú, ningún error has cometido, nunca cometerás error, perfecto corazón. sublime precioso eres en todo todas de tus obras revelan tu corazón revela tu pureza tus intenciones en mi nación, en mi nación. De los cielos y la tierra eres Dios. Con tu gloria llenas todo Señor Nada existe si no fuera por ti Si tú eres el 
principio y el fin de los cielos y la tierra eres Dios con tu gloria llenas todo Señor nada existe si no fuera por ti si tú eres el principio y el fin eres inmenso insuperable quien llena todo en todo Señor en ti se origina el universo entero todo fue creado para darte adoración nada te iguala eres único todo se sujeta a tu autoridad tú dominas todo majestoso rey fuerza inquebrantable tuyo es el poder tuyo es el poder de los cielos y la tierra eres Dios con tu gloria llenas todo Señor Nada existe si no fuera por ti Si tú eres el principio y el fin Eres inmenso, insuperable Que llena todo, todo Señor En ti se origina el universo entero todo fue creado para darte adoración nada te iguala eres único todo se sujeta a tu autoridad tú dominas todo Majestoso Rey, tu fuerza inquebrantable, tuyo es el poder, nada te iguala, eres único, todo se sujeta a tu autoridad, tú dominas todo, majestoso Rey. If there's something that we declare and understand with clarity, that yours is the power, the glory, the honor, and the majesty, O oh God. We glorify you and we bless you for the gloriousness of what you are. And because of your manifestation, in us and the way in which you've determined to exalt your name in Christian Mission to Calvary. You have sent your Holy Spirit to glorify Jesus Christ in each one of the temples where we are meeting in the homes, or in the different places where each servant, each disciple of Christian Mission to Calvary we found ourselves with you to listen to your voice, to attend to your commandments, to be obedient and become the expression of your word. We bless you, O oh Lord, and we magnify your marvelous name. Amen. Glorious is the name of the Lord. Blessings to all of Christian Mission to Calvary, wherever you're seeing us.
we declare that glory of the Lord over each one of you. And with all certainty, we understand that the Holy Spirit today will continue to glorify Jesus Christ among all of us. It doesn't matter where we're meeting. And it's wonderful that Christian Mission to Calvary is understanding this marvelous way that the Lord is teaching us. It's not the result of a situation that is happening in a general sense in the world and that we are adjusting to these situations, referring to the transmissions online. No, simply we are understanding that there's something that the Lord wants us to see and that it becomes our lifestyle. Precisely this is what has to do with what we'll be talking about today. I'd like to begin mentioning a few passages in the scripture. I'll try to do it as fast as possible in these four passages so that we can begin to establish an understanding of what we'll be talking about. I'll mention many portions of the scripture here, so let's pay attention. If we have the agility to look for it, let's not be distracted either doing so. Let's pay attention or let's see on the, on the video the passages that we'll be sharing. Galatians chapter 1 verse 2. And all the brothers who are with me. This is the emphasis I want to make. To the churches of Galatia. To the churches of Galatia. Not to the church of Galatia. It says to the churches, plural, churches of Galatia. Philemon chapter 1 verse 2. And to beloved sister Appia and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that is in your house. I highlight again this last part. And to the church that is in your house. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19. The churches of Asia greet you. Again, it doesn't say the church of Asia. It says the churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Priscilla, with the church that is in their house, greet you much in the Lord. Again, in this passage, we confirm the two aspects that we saw earlier. And the one last passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 1, always highlighting these same principles. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is in Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia. With all the saints which are in all Achaia. Very well. If we pay attention to these four passages of the scripture, of course, there are many more that speak of the same thing. But at least we see these four today. We find a principle that is marvelous that the church is experiencing experiencing and enjoying and it is the expansion and the multiplication of the church the church that is in your home the churches in galatia the churches in asia the church that is in the house of aquila and priscilla all the saints that in are all of achaia it was a multiplication of disciples in all of that region here it's not making a reference only to different churches, but to the expansion of the disciples of Christ had extended in all of Achaia. So we find a marvelous principle, and that's that expansion and multiplication that was the lifestyle of the church. We find 
in homes, we find a diversity or multiplication of churches. Even though the Lord has been talking to us for many years about this, I remember so much time ago, the Lord has been speaking to us about the multiplication of churches in different places. But it seems as though we are still holding on to the understanding that if I am, I'll mention any city, if I am in zone one of the capital city of Guatemala, no one else can open another church in zone one in the capital city because I am already in that zone. If I'm in a department, a municipality, a state, I don't have the mentality to open more churches of the mission because I'm already in a certain department, in a certain portion, any state, any city. When the Lord for many, for much time has been telling us about this principle in the scripture, the churches in Galatia. In one same place, there is a multiplication of churches. There was a conflict. Uh, thanks be to God that this scheme, the schema has been removed from our mentality and this multiplication is starting. But there's still certain type of jealousy. If it's a result or it's a product of this local church or another church, whatever it may be, but there's a new church established by the mission where I am at. There's still a little bit of conflict with, with this pastor, with this church, because I'm a, I was already here first. I think we all have clear that none of us as a church, much less as ministers, are owners and lords of a certain state, certain city, any zone or sector. We are not lords or owners. It's Jesus Christ, the owner of all things. So here, this multiplication of churches leaves it clear to us in different in the same place, but it also breaks a scheme, a schema that we are holding on to that the Lord in one way or another has been working with us as a mission, the church that is in your home. Note that in at least four of these passages, you can read many more and you'll realize it's a great principle, in none of them do we highlight mega temples, constructions or edifications that were crucial to congregate. If you notice, the multiplication of the church in the book of Acts never held back. But it didn't depend on temples. Obviously, we're not speaking against the construction and building of great temples. Of course not. What I'd like to establish is that the multiplication does not depend on we do have a temple or we don't have a temple or how big is the temple. Even though if I'm holding on to a small temple, that will definitely damage the and, and hold back the multiplication. That's super clear and made perfectly clear among us. The Lord has been ministering and raising ministers and disciples, but the temples have provoked a stagnation that has been quite terrible, where there has never been able to exist a multiplication and development because the temples don't allow it. Many, much time ago, I would say it's not the shoe that, that depends, that determines the foot. The foot is the one that determines the shoe size. And us, because we're holding on to these temples that since I have memory of, I know a great majority of temples that are in still the same location and the same size. That means that there's been a stagnation, a schema that we've not been able to break but that the Holy Spirit breaks today in Jesus Christ's name. 
Because this multiplication that we see here is not depending on temples or places. It's simply based on the obedience to the commandment of God and the application of that commandment. But that application according to the design. But something has to happen here that's very important. And the Lord has been working in this Congress a lot. And that's the change of mentality. When we speak of the change of mentality, we ha I have to understand the correct perspective of the scriptures. And not what I've seen traditionally or what I assume. I'd like to mention another point that's fundamental to continue to advance today. A lot is spoken about the concept of being instruments in the hands of God or being useful instruments in the hands of God. In many messages, we could also, many ministers have said, well, how many want to be instruments, useful instruments in the hands of the Lord? Oh, amen. Raise your hands. Those that want to be instruments, and everyone raises their hands because every one of us wants to be useful instruments. How much has been highlighted in the experience, for example, of Isaiah, when he sees the Lord sitting in his, in his throne, high and sublime, surrounded by so much glory, and God says, who will I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah quickly says, I am here send me. Oh, how many of us have said, Lord, send me. I am here. I want to be your instrument, Lord. Perfect. That's wonderful. But let's understand correctly what it means to be an instrument that is useful in the hands of God. I'd like to mention 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. And this is a translation called Traducción Lenguaje Actual, which will be translated to English. Something similar happens with us. If we stop doing bad things and forget about false teachings, we will be like those useful and very special objects. Now look at this. Our whole life will be useful to God, who is its owner. And we will be prepared to do all kinds of good. Our whole life will be useful to God. The scripture tells us then of the importance of becoming useful instruments. The issue is that we've not understood with clarity this understanding of having being a useful instrument instrument because being a useful instrument doesn't have to do with the value of the instrument necessarily nor does it mean or have to do with the sentimentality well this tool was given to me by my grandfather and my grandfather gave it to my father and it represents something so special to me if it's a useful instrument it has nothing to do with sentimentality or economically, or its value itself. When it's a useful instrument, it has to do with its utility, the use that we give to that tool. For example, we could think the kitchen of the home. We can have a lot of tools, a lot of instruments that are very valuable, and pricey, what do I know? You bought a blender that's very expensive. The blender was 1,200 quetzales or $150. Or maybe you have a coffee maker that was $200 or a microwave that was very expensive, expensive tools. But suddenly, the most useful instrument you have is a spoon that costs you a dollar, but it's the tool that you use the most. Maybe it's something else, it's just an example. Uh, your most useful tool in the kitchen. So what is the useful tool? Well, whatever you use the most. What you use the most, that's a useful instrument, not what costed the most or cost the most, not what 
is more value with sentimentality. You may have a lot of sentimental tools and you might love them a lot. However, it doesn't mean that it is a useful tool because a useful tool is something that you use always. What you use on a daily basis. So we understand and we see ourselves as instru useful instruments, useful tools because of the love that God has for us, for the sentimental value we have, and as the value of children of God, we are purchased with the blood of Christ. We are worth the blood of Christ, correct? This is exact. But we think that because of that value, we are useful tools. But if I ask, how many of us is God using? Or how many of us are allowing God to use us? There we have a different situation. Because it's those that allow themselves to be used by God that become useful tools. We don't doubt in no way about the love of God and the value that we have before God. For God, we are very valuable. He loves us in such a way, in such magnitude that he sent his son for us. Perfect. That's undoubtable. But me being a useful instrument doesn't give me value to God. My utility is based on what God can use me for. How much am I serving? Did I become a useful tool or am I just a knickknack on the wall? Some collect plates or little spoons that are collectibles that are set up there in a china on the wall that that can't be touched. You can't touch those plates because they are inherited from our great grandmother or because we bought them in a foreign country and it costs so much and we never use those plates and they have a high emotional value. But what use are they? Aside from a sentimental one, but it's not a useful tool or useful instrument. The church of Jesus Christ was not designed by God to be behind glass so that the world can see them and say, wow, those are so valuable. Look at those tools. The church of Jesus Christ was designed to become useful tools for God. Therefore, being a useful tool is not determined by the value that I have because we are valuable to God. But being a useful tool is determined by that life and what we mentioned earlier in 2 Timothy, that whole life that will be useful to God. Our whole life will be useful to God. Let me ask you something. Your life. Is your life being useful to God? Think for a moment. The tendency frequently is to answer immediately, yeah, of course it is. But is your life being useful to God? Useful for his purpose? Useful for his expansion? Useful to reveal himself and let himself be known? Useful to accomplish his glorious plan? Is your life being useful to God. The church was not designed to entertain itself, nor to hold itself back. The church was designed to be a useful tool in the hands of God. Because we were rescued from sin, says the scripture, and we have been made servants of God. So that process, that change that the Lord has been speaking to us about, the transfer of the dominion of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son, makes us useful tools to God and servants of God. 
not in assistance, but useful tools. Everything that we're talking about and we're reading about, let's see it under the perspective on becoming a useful tool, not feeling ourselves as useful tools. It's one thing that I feel that I am a useful tool. And it's another thing that I am being a useful tool to God. Of course, it's important to feel as though I am a useful tool. But don't keep it at that level of saying, I know I'm valuable to God. I know I'm useful to God, but I'm not serving him. I'm not preaching his word. I'm not discipling anyone. I'm not executing the manifestation of the power of God. I'm not representing God. So I feel useful. However, I'm not being useful to fulfill his purpose. And this is where we need to, as a mission, understand. And I know with certainty that Christian Mission to Calvary feels and understands that they are useful to God. Now the challenge is that we become useful for the purpose of God. Not that we feel that we are useful, but that we become useful each day more and more into useful tools. Because God can be using me. Well, well, uh, sometimes he uses me. Sometimes I serve him. And that's why I feel like I'm useful. When God says you're a useful tool, he is speaking about someone that is dedicated totally to his service. Someone that God can use in the moment that God needs it, in the task that God needs, and in the place that God demands. The useful tool is not the one that chooses when and where to serve, what to do and what not to do. The useful tool is the one that allows itself to be used by God wherever and whenever God wants. That's a useful tool. When we combine what we've been teaching with these four passages of a mentality of a church that is expansive, that is living and enjoying a multiplication, when we unite it with this mentality of being useful tools, we find the why the church was multiplying. Because each disciple and each minister not only felt useful, but that they were being useful for God. That becoming a useful tool has its beginnings, as the Lord has been speaking to us in this Congress, in our way of thinking. How do I become a useful tool? Not just praying, Lord, I am here, use me. But I become a useful tool starting with my way of thinking. And of course, it's a transcend to action. But let's begin in the way of thinking. Quickly, I mentioned Acts 10.34. You know that God had to work in the mentality of Peter. Peter opens his vision of a wrapping that falls down and he sees different animals on this image. And the Lord says, kill and eat. And Peter says, no, Lord, because never have I eaten unworldly things. This repeats three times until Peter understands. Don't call unworldly what I have sanctified already. And so Peter is sent to the house of Cornelius. And when he hears the testimony of Cornelius, the angel calls him and he tells him this in Acts 10.34. Then Peter, opening his mouth, said, Truly I understand that God is no respecter of persons. I truly understand that God is no respecter of persons. Pay attention to this. Truly I understand. What is happening here? Truly I understand. There has to be a change in his way of thinking so that he could understand the things as God was understanding them. 
Peter, even though he was a big instrument, a servant, apostle, preacher of the word, that he was a tremendous servant, of course. But there was something that he needed to change. And it was his mentality of expansion. Because Peter, even though he was a tremendous preacher, but he still had a mentality of only the Jewish people. Now, God wants to take Peter to the dimension of nations to reach Gentiles to expand his ministry. And Peter is worked on by the Lord. And now he says, truly I understand. Now I get it. That God doesn't make an exception of people. It's the expansion and multiplication mentality of God that makes God those that he doesn't hold anyone back. He doesn't have exceptions of people. When we see the case of Abraham, it's the same principle in Genesis. That same principle that God needs to work in Abraham. Because God needs to teach Abraham a change of mentality so that he can understand the dimension. Genesis 12, 2. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Look what he says. I will make of you a great nation. The promise of God for the life of Abraham was a promise of expansion. It wasn't limited. It wasn't cut short. But Abraham had something, something that had to happen in his heart, was to visualize the purpose and the plan of God, but not to his dimension, but rather to the dimension of God. And so we see in Abraham that he's dimensioning, we'll say. He's visualizing. He's understanding the magnitude of the purpose of God and the promise of God. The promise is that we translate the vision of God to our way of thinking. And if there is no change in my mentality, we'll always have this problem. Translating. God says, I will multiply you. And maybe we're thinking, I'm doing, I'm 15 people. Maybe that means we're going to be 45 people. Just to put an example. It's a hundred of us. He's going to multiply us. Maybe he's talking about being 500 of us. So I'm translating what God is telling me. But I'm translating it to my limited view. And what should happen Our mentality should be the same as that of Christ. We have the mind of Christ, the Apostle Paul said. We need that Christian mission to Calvary. Each minister, each pastor, each pastor's wife, each disciple of all the mission have the same mentality of God. When God speaks, he will... He says, I will multiply you. Let's not see that multiplication based on our limitedness or limitation or wherever you may be. Let's see what God is saying. What does he say? Look at the stars. Can you count them? Look at the the sand at the ocean. Can you count it? That's how your descendants will be. What is God working with Abraham? A capacity of understanding God. If there's something that we need to understand is that the expansion takes us to possess. But multiplication and growth positions us to have influence. It's very different. Expansion takes us to possess each time more and more. We expand, we possess. But that multiplication and that growth takes us to a position of influence and respect before everyone. 
That's why the church, very little is respected and recognized. Because its influence isn't great. Because it hasn't multiplied. Let me tell you, let me say it this way, just to establish a principle. Nobody wants to receive counsel of financial multiplication from a broke person. Because what can a poor person teach someone that doesn't live it? But everyone runs to seminars of financial multiplication. Those that are rich, I want to learn from the rich guy. How does he live? Does that make sense? It's the same principle. When the when will the church be respected? When will people want to follow the church? When they reveal Christ, but when will this happen? When the church is positioned in a place of influence. Multiplication will bring that about. So the mentality has to change. God says to Abraham, about your descendants. He uses this because multiplication and expansion mentality is generational. It's not momentary. It's not limited. It's generational. And I like to put this passage as well as something that should that the mission should hold on to. Romans chapter 4, verse 13. Look at this. For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not given to Abraham or to his offspring by the law. For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not given to Abraham or to his offspring by the law. Now, what is the promise that it's speaking about? That he would be heir of the world, but by the righteousness of faith. Let's forget a little bit, not because it's not worthy, but of the emphasis I want to make. It wasn't by law, but by righteousness of faith. Okay, perfect. Let's focus a little bit on the level and the dimension of the promise. God didn't give Abraham a promise of just having a lot of children. The promise of God to Abraham was to be to heir the world, inherit the world. When we come to Christ and we become children of Abraham through the work of Jesus Christ and heirs of the promise, it means that it's the church of Jesus Christ that it corresponds to to inherit the world. So when God speaks to us about multiplication, we think about double of what we have and triple, four, five times what we have now. Someone can have a mentality that is greater and says, I want to be 10 times more what we are. But look at the mentality of God. He is not thinking about us being 10 or 20 more than what we are today. He's thinking about us inheriting the world. So Christian Mission to Calvary cannot be thinking about congregations of 5,000, of 10,000, of 20,000. Christian Mission to Calvary should be thinking about inheriting the world and making disciples in all the nations and of all the nations preaching to all creation that's the mentality that christian mission to calvary should have apostle but at least we reached our village our community our sector at least we got three neighbors coming we have such a limited mentality and so poor that we haven't visualized that the calling and the promise of God for Abraham and therefore us as church are heirs of that promise is possess the world. It's inherit the world. 
It means that today, because of the glorious work of the Spirit, all mentality should stop. That is limited and poor of multiplication, of being double of what we are. At least filling the temple that we've built. Because some, that's their goal. Because they've built great temples and beautiful ones in terms of size. But the goal is at least let's fill this building. The goal is not to fill the temple, however big it may be. It's to inherit the world. That's the goal that God established in his promise to Abraham. Therefore, it is the goal of the church because the church has become an heir of that promise. Everyone that is born again has inherited the promise of God of Abraham. Therefore, the mentality of expansion should change. The issue is that the Lord still has to work in us. Like he said through the prophet Isaiah to the people. In Isaiah 54, 2 and 3. Isaiah 54, 2 to 3. Because you will reach out to the right hand and to the left hand. It says, do not be scarce. Enlarge the size of your tent and let the curtains of your rooms be drawn. Do not be scarce. Do not be scarce. Lengthen your ropes and strengthen your stakes because you will reach out to the right hand and to the left hand. And your offspring, listen well, the same principle is repeated in all of Scripture. And your offspring will inherit nations and will inhabit the desolate cities. Again, I highlight important points that we have here. Do not be scarce. Christian Mission to Calvary, do not be scarce. Because the promise of God will be fulfilled. It doesn't have to do with our capacity. It doesn't determine itself by our ability. I'm not saying that we don't grow or develop. But the multiplication is not determined by our resources nor our capacities. The multiplication is determined by the promise of the Almighty God to execute and complete what he said that will happen. You will go to the left hand and to the right hand. Something real. They aren't promises of probabilities. They are certainties that God is declaring. You will reach out to the right hand and to the left hand. And look at this. And your offspring will inherit nations. Christian Mission to Calvary. This generation and the following generations will inherit nations. Because it is the promise of God. It's not the human capacity of Christian mission to Calvary. Never. Never is it rooted. Is it rooted in our human strength? Never has the promise been rooted in what we humanly are. Never. Could we pretend that we will be multiplied because we are good? And as we say, Because we're always on the ball. We're always on the money. The root of the promise has never been in our human capacity. But in the capacity of God who gave that promise. He did give us his spirit. Therefore, the spirit that we have received. Is a spirit that gives us the power to become witnesses and reach the nations for Jesus Christ. He hasn't given us a spirit of cowardice, but a power of love and self-control. And the apostle Paul says it, therefore do not be ashamed of giving a testimony. The spirit of power is to give testimony of Jesus Christ, not to be feel courageous, not just to feel not scared, no. 
if you read the context of that passage, it has to do with the expansion of the preaching of the gospel. That spirit that God has given us is to give testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, the fulfillment of his promise is because of his capacity. But it should happen. Something should occur in us. And is to break that schema, that mentality of limitation that we've had. Do not be scarce. Servants of God, don't be scarce in your way of thinking. Discipler, don't be scarce in your way of thinking. At least with the five that we have, hey, we're starting. These five, these 10, these 11, none of them have left. They're wonderful brothers. Praise be to God. We have that, that scarce mentality. The expansion and multiplication. We've forgotten that the goal of God is that we inherit nations. That we make disciples of all the nations. That we preach the gospel to all creation. We continue to preach and we're experts to preach among ourselves. But we forget about the important task of preaching to the nations. We are good discipling and teaching ourselves as congregation. But what about people? Multitudes? There's no passion in us as Jesus manifested it. When we see the multitudes, Jesus says clearly that he had compassion because he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. If there's something that Christian Mission of the Calvary should have, and to understand the condition of the world, that the world has an urgent need to be shepherded by Jesus Christ. The world is walking aimlessly and lost as a sheep without a shepherd. We're not talking about us as pastors. We're talking about coming to the Lordship of Christ and being shepherded by Jesus Christ. The greatest need of the human being is the knowledge of God, of knowing God and knowing Jesus Christ. That's what eternal life consists of, knowing you and the Son you have sent. That's what the world needs to know. But we're so busy in our meetings, in our activities. The tendency is that we fill our agenda so much. Sorry, Lord, we don't have time for the nations. We don't have time for the unknown. We don't have time for those people that don't know us, for people that are far away or even close by. Lord, we're so busy here, we're serving you. No. The useful instrument, the useful tool, is because the Lord uses it for whatever he wants. No, what, not what the instrument decides. It's what the Lord has determined to do with that instrument. So if there's something that we have to understand, is that this multiplication in the part of God is the lifestyle of the church. We begin understanding that diverse multiplication that happened in homes, different churches, different places, the multiplication of disciples in Achaia. We understand the principle of becoming instruments that are useful, not to feel it, but to be truly being used, to be truly used by God. Search to be used by God. Seek to be a useful instrument to God. And I'm referring to not only saying, Pastor, Apostle Ronald said that I have to be a useful tool. So please, if you could give me some time on Sunday so I can preach. No, we're not talking about that. Being a useful tool never, in no way, 
is it limited to be preaching on Sundays or preaching from a pulpit? Being a useful tool is to be used by God to what he has sent us to do as a church. Seek to be used by God. Don't seek to feel valuable for God. That's important. Seek to be used. Let yourself be used. Become a useful tool. How? Serving. How? Doing what God has sent you to do. That's how you become a useful tool. Not crying out, not asking only, but doing what he has called us to do. So this should become the lifestyle of the church. When Jesus, I just mentioned it in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come over you, and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Because Jesus establishes an order and a, and a mentality of expansion. You know clearly that Luke was the one that wrote the book of Acts. And I love seeing the narration. Of course, we understand with clarity that the Holy Spirit guided all of this. That's undoubtable. But I love to see the narration of Luke. How Luke dedicates himself to more things, but of course, to dedicate himself the, to describe the fulfillment of the commandment of Jesus. Jesus says, you will be witnesses in Jerusalem, and all of Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the world. And the narration, if you pay attention to the book of Acts, the narration of Luke goes from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. Pay attention how this happens, how it starts in Jerusalem, that movement of the church, but then Luke begins to narrate how disciples begin to preach in Judea. Others expand to Samaria. And the book of Acts ends with the Apostle Paul preaching in all the nations. I love this because Jesus gives a commandment but the church fulfills it to perfection. The Holy Spirit is executing the plan of Christ. Luke has the capacity of visualizing and telling us how what Jesus declared, the Holy Spirit executed it. And the church was an instrument for this. So we find how the church begins to develop, but understanding that it was a lifestyle. I'm going to mention two passages. Acts chapter 5, verse 14. And Acts 6, 7. Let's start with Acts 5, 14. And those who believed in the Lord increased more. Great numbers, both men and women. And Acts 6, 7 says like this. And the word of the Lord increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Also, many of the priests obeyed the faith. Pay attention to this. And the word of the Lord increased. And the number of disciples multiplied greatly where? In Jerusalem. So I want to highlight here is that in these two passages, it's speaking about a multiplication. And those that believed in the Lord, it says that they grew in the first passage that we read, like men and women. And the word grew, when it says that the word grew, it's referring more people each day were preaching the gospel of the Lord. Does that make sense? Not that every day they had more work to do. Of course, they had more work to do. 
But here it's referring to that the church was understanding its function and executing its responsibility of preaching the word. And so the word grew, the word of the Lord grew. And the consequence was that the number of the disciples were multiplying in Jerusalem. So I'm establishing this as a principle that we will soon understand. Multiplication and evangelism was happening already in the church. It started there, yes, in Jerusalem. But now the preaching, the disciples were preaching. Of course, the apostles were doing that as well. But the church itself was preaching, and that's why it says that the word of the Lord grew. The result was that the number of the disciples were being multiplied. This is as simple as this. There cannot be a multiplication of disciples if there is no growth in the preaching of the word of God. When I say there's no growth, it's not falling on the responsibility of the pastor, but in every single disciple of Jesus Christ. If the disciples of Christ, including the pastor, obviously, were not preaching the gospel, then the number of disciples won't be multiplied. But, oh, yeah, we're preaching a lot. We're preaching Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays. Yeah, yeah. But we preach amongst ourselves. Here it's not preaching amongst ourselves only. Of course, they meet to listen to the word of God. They would per persevere in the doctrine of the apostles. The discipleship was fundamental. That's clear. But here, it's emphasizing that the number of the disciples grew. It means that the preaching was not being done in the temples as now we see it. It was happening outside with people that didn't recognize the Lordship of Christ. Now, we read many times in the scriptures that they would meet in the temples and the homes. But what temple is it referring to? When we hear the term temple, we visualize it as our temples, or maybe the mega temples that we've seen. Because we've heard that first the 3,000 converted, then 5,000. Then the men there at least, that was like 15, 20,000 people. Because it says, Acts 4, that those that converted and believed, the, name, the number was about 5,000 men, plus women, plus children. But each day, the Lord would add those that would be saved. So the church was very big. So when we speak about the church meeting in the temples, we're not talking about mega temples. The only temples that was existing there was the one that Solomon had built many years before. And so if you go back to the scripture to, to study the measurements of the temple, it was very small. It had wonderful luxuries, wonderful details. True, but it was very small. It was a temple that had it, the Holy of Holies, the holy place. It wasn't a temple as we visualize it today, a space, a warehouse, a place with no columns. But that's not what was there. Why am I saying this? Because the multiplication of the church will never depend on on if there is a temple or if there is not a temple. If they had the adequate space or they didn't. Lord, if you allow them to uh, let us rent the Roman Colosseum, we'll multiply. No, the church wasn't depending on places. It was depending on the commandment of Jesus Christ. What they were doing was fulfilling the commandment of Jesus Christ. And not to use an excuse of the temple or lack thereof of course we can see the church in your home that repeats in many passages of the scripture the church in your home 
however big the churches can be, however big the homes can be, they weren't warehouses of, of 2,000 square feet or 4,000 square feet. Never, even if they used homes, never did the dimensions of the locations of the buildings, they were never the stumbling block for the multiplication and expansion of the church. Today, it is. Those that have no temple, they'd say, if we had a temple. And those that have a temple say, we can't grow anymore. There's no more space. Or we leave to another, rent or pay, pay for the cost, higher cost of rent. Here, it's property of the mission of many years. We've never paid rent. And now to pay rent, we have fear of going to these places. It means that the temples are becoming a stumbling block of the of provoking the multiplication. They're stumbling blocks because they're limiting us to the multiplication. Or including the construction of a temple can st stop multiplication because all the attention, all the strength, all the economy, all the preaching, all the meetings are focused on getting money to build the temple and the church stops expanding, stops discipling, stops discipling because everything is rooted in getting money for the construction. So what I wanna highlight is one or the other thing we're allowing. We can do these things, but we can't allow them to distract us from the principal principal objective of the church. Of course we can build temples, but don't let it distract us and paralyze us of the expansion and multiplication. I can be without a temple, but that shouldn't paralyze us for the multiplication and expansion of the church. Am I making sense? This is the objective of the Lord. So, here's where something begins to happen. The church is growing in Jerusalem. The disciples are preaching the word, but something very important happens. Acts chapter 8 says, Verses 1 through 4. And Saul consented to his death. And on that day there was a great persecution against the church that was in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered. To this moment, the church was still in Jerusalem. But as we saw in previous passages, they were starting to multiply. They were preaching the word of God. That's why I made an emphasis that the, the word of the Lord grew. There was a great persecution against the church that was in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered through the lands of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now I'm reading verse 4. But those who were scattered went everywhere announcing the gospel. Well, there's so much points that are valuable. In the first place, the church was limited to Jerusalem. The second place, the persecution made the entire world flee. They would leave the place where they were living, their comfort zone, except the apostles. They were the only ones that didn't leave in this persecution. Now, what is it that the church was doing but those that were scattered went everywhere announcing the gospel. Went everywhere announcing the gospel. Now I ask something that's already obvious. Who was going around announcing the gospel? Well, it was the disciples. The church itself. Because it was the church that was scattered. And it's tremendous because the scripture makes an emphasis on the apostles were staying in Jerusalem. So when it speaks of that preaching, 
that expansive preaching, it's not referring to the apostles. It's referring to the entire church because clearly it says those that were scattered. Here it doesn't say, and the disciples of those that were scattered. And some of those that were scattered. It says those that were scattered were preaching everywhere. The wonderful part of this, it wasn't the work of the apostles of organization or delegation. The preaching wasn't a result of a, an apostolic or pastoral program. The preaching was the lifestyle of the church. Many have said, that the persecution provoked the church to preach. And that's why I cleared up earlier that the church was already preaching. Because the persecution didn't provoke preaching. The persecution provoked expansion. But the expansion was given as a result that the church was already having as a lifestyle the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom of God. It can't happen that we multiply and expand as God wants. If we haven't converted as a church into a church that preaches the gospel of Christ. There you go, pastor. You're getting it hard today. No, no, no. I'm not talking about the pastors. I'm talking about the entire church, including the pastors that are part of the church. This is not the work of ministers only. This is the work of every disciple of Jesus Christ, of every child of God, of every redeemed that allows themselves to be used of the useful tool here, the church was being useful to God. How? Not because it felt proud that they were children of God and I'm useful. No. It became useful because they were allowing themselves to be used by the Lord. They were preaching his word. They were manifesting the power of God. They were expanding the gospel. So the gospel became a useful tool. They were moved by the Lord. That's why the... Scripture says that they were going everywhere, announcing it was the Holy Spirit governing and guiding. In Acts chapter 11, verse 19 through 21, highlights the same principle that we're talking about here. Acts 11, 19 through 21. Now those who had been scattered because of the persecution that took place over Stephen passed through as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. Look at the difference here. Not speaking the word to no one, but only to the Jews. Well, many people of those that were going here had a mentality that was limited. They were preaching, but a limited mentality. But it's interesting how it highlights but there were among them some men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who, when they entered Antioch, also spoke to the Greeks, announcing the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. One day, I want to be in front of the pastor of Cyprus and Cyrene and congratulate them for the great discipleship they had with the church. All of them were executed, but with a mentality that was limited only to the Jews. But these disciples of Cyprus and Cyrene had such a wonderful discipleship. They didn't put buts, they didn't put limits. They preached the gospel to everyone all people. And so they started to preach to the Greeks, those that weren't Jews. And they established this wonderful church in Antioch. Those from Cyprus and Cyrene had a 
more expansive mentality than the others. Christian Mission to Calvary should have an, a, an expansive mentality, not scarce, not limited. Today, we've had a huge fashion trend in the, in the general sense. Someone says, no, we're going to raise a church of businessmen, only businessmen. And so they seek out only bosses and all businessmen. Others say, no, we're going to dedicate ourselves to the poor. Let's preach to the poor. And the church is filled with people of this condition. Some preach to one sector, to others to another sector. And we don't realize that we're failing to the principle of the word that is, to all creation. Some for one interest, some for another interest. But in the end, they're all interests that we focus on in a different sector. The Church of Jesus Christ will never place a limit or a stumbling block to someone that has money or someone that is poor. Never can it close its doors to someone that is in financial difficulty or someone that is in abundance or vice versa. Some say, no, this rich man, no, no, no. He's probably cold. He has nothing to do with God. He can't even enter the kingdom of heaven because it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And we start to put stops. There are people there that God has determined to save, of course, in every atmosphere, in every social level, economic one. Christian Mission to Calvary you cannot have a scarce and limited mentality, but a mentality of expansion. So those from Cyprus and Cyrene, they weren't sectarians. They were expansive to preach the gospel and look at the glory of the Lord was manifested. And it says, and the hand of the Lord was with them in the terms that we're referring to now, of those of Cyprus and Cyrene, they became useful instruments for God. Not because they felt, or not because of their value, but because of their execution. They made themselves useful. You and I should make ourselves useful instruments, not to do what we want, but to do what we were called to do. This is the principle of a useful instrument or tool. So we see that the discipling work of the apostles had, had given fruit because the church had a lifestyle of evangelism. They didn't preach because they were being persecuted. They were preaching because they were it was part of their lifestyle. The preaching just provoked expansion, and they were going everywhere announcing the gospel. But before that, they had announced it in Jerusalem. The problem now is that we haven't begun to announce the gospel even in our Jerusalem, much less in all of Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the world. We need to understand that our discipleship has to form a mentality of multiplication and expansion in the church. We need to equip, we need to teach the church to be efficient in its responsibility of multiplication. Now the Lord has told us this so many times. God hasn't called us to entertain the church. God has called us to perfect it, to do the work of the ministry. And that work of the ministry includes that expansion. That's why the church was efficient in its evangelistic task because the discipleship had prepared them for that. But in this principle, we also need to understand, and I hope that we understand it with the correct spirit, what I'm about to say. 
There is something that as a mission we need to repent for and ask forgiveness from the Lord. And I'll explain it this way. When a person feels proud of something, they comment it, they talk about it, they let it be known, they exhibit it. When someone is proud of something, have you seen these girlfriends that the day that they were given the ring, they take pictures like this with their ring showing it off. The pictures are there with the ring. She's out of focus, but the ring is very focused. They're highlighting that because they want to show off. They want to make known they're, they're proud of that moment. And it's fine. It's wonderful. What I want to highlight is that when you're proud of something, you let it be known. You hide what you're not proud of. Have you seen someone has a issue, physical situation? Something on their forehead that they don't want others to see. They usually, they use their hair and they cover themselves, right? To hide something that they don't want others to see. Maybe it's a, a, a hit, a, a a mark, a scar, whatever, but they hide it. Isn't that true? Regularly, we hide what we don't want to show off. We're ashamed of saying and mentioning that we don't want others to know about. But we announce it when we're proud of it. Now, here's the question. How proud of you? How proud are you? How proud are we of Jesus Christ in the gospel? That's why Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is power of God for salvation. To the Jew first and then to the Greek. I am not ashamed of the gospel. If there's something that should move Christian move Christian mission to Calvary is the pride that we have of serving God, that pride of the power of the gospel to change a life in its totality. The gospel does not reform. The gospel transforms. The system of the world, the education, society, culture can mold conducts but it can never change the nature. The gospel of Jesus Christ has the power to change the nature. That's why the apostle Paul says, because it is power of God for salvation, because it has the power to change the nature of sin to a new nature, to a new life in Christ. Well, apostle, how do you dare to say that I'm not proud of God nor of the gospel? Well, Do you share it? Do you announce it? Do you preach it? Or do you just stay quiet? You stay, you hide it. There are some that have workplace friends that have never found out that they're Christians. Maybe there's family that don't even know that you're a child of God. You're embarrassed that they're going to make fun of you. It's embarrassing. You're not proud of Jesus Christ, nor of the gospel. What a terrible, terrible world. Those friends of the world that they sit down and say, whoa, man, this weekend, I drank 10 beers. How many drink? Dude, I had 15 beers. Oh my God. And they make a party because they went to a party and committed this and this and they're proud of those things they should be ashamed of those things today we have gay pride they have big banners announcing that they're gay that there's homosexual homosexuality lesbian trans banners they're proud of their life of sin 
and the child of God hiding. Hopefully my boss doesn't figure out I'm a Christian. Hopefully my friends don't find out that I'm connected watching the Congress. As Christian Mission to Calvary, I know there are clear exceptions. But in the majority, we need to ask forgiveness from God because we haven't been proud of what we true what truly deserves pride and that is to have Jesus Christ as my Lord is to surrender my life to Jesus the friend and the family guy you don't go to a party you don't drink no no that's not good for you and they're all proud yeah we go to parties and you don't say bad words? No, it's, uh, you know, it sounds terrible with, with shame. And you don't do these things? The world can come to people and say, don't you cheat on your wife? Don't you look at other women? No, I don't want to talk about that. That's embarrassing. The world is proud when they have a lover or the wife has a lover as well. That the young man has many girlfriends, proud. How many girlfriends do you have, man? Five of them. How many do you have? Ah, oh, three. Just that? Oh, come on. You don't have a girlfriend? Uh, no, nah, you know, none's come up. And we're embarrassed to say that we're, that we're saving ourselves for God. You haven't had sex yet? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I have. No, be proud to live in holiness. Blessed is the man that wasn't in the counsel of the wicked, nor seated in in the chair of scoffers but today the world is proud of their sins and the christian is embarrassed to live in holiness and honor god it's a terrible sin that we've committed feeling ashamed of the gospel when it's the greatest pride that the human being can have to have the only true and living God. They party because they, they go out to processions and worship other idols, carry idols in processions. And we that worship the true God, we do it hiding. We don't announce it. Christian Mission to Calvary should be yelling to the four winds. Jesus is our King and our Lord. There is only one God and only one Lord. If there's something that we should announce to the four winds, is that Jesus is the only way, is the truth, and he is the life. No one comes to the Father if it's not through Jesus Christ. With what pride. And this is eternal life. That they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. With what pride did he say it with? And we. Uh, yeah, give your life to Christ. Repent for your sins because uh, we say it with shame. We take them out from being taken out of the glory of God to be submerged in the glory of Christ. It's time to repent and ask forgiveness from the Lord. Because we've not had a mentality of expansion. We've been conformed with what we are. 
in the sense of multiplication. When God is expecting us to have a mentality of possessing and inheriting the nations. Christian Mission to Calvary, you were called to inherit the nations, inherit the world. Never allow the enemy to limit you. Servants of God, let's disciple and equip and perfect the church, not to feel good, but to be useful to God. The church nowadays is focused in that Christians feel good, to tell them that God loves them. Today, there was a good service because I came out happy. I was encouraged. It was such a heavy week, but the preaching gave me strength. Now, we were called to make the church useful instruments. Their life submerged in Christ is the one that gives value and should give pride and should give encouragement and satisfaction. A child of God cannot be living depressed. If they're living in Christ, if they're connected to the vine, they can't live depressed. But it's that change in our mentality. God has called us to have a, an expansive mentality and one of multiplication. Let's preach the gospel to all creature. Let's stand up as Christian Mission to Calvary and understand that the Lord has revealed his heart and his intention of multiplying us. And that we are proud to talk about Jesus Christ. To live as a child of God should live and to give the profile that the world needs to see and understand. The sinner and the one that is away from God should be the one that is ashamed. But the church feels intimidated. We take our position in Jesus Christ. And that we say, as the Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is power of God. So in Jesus Christ's name, let's stand and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the good news of Jesus Christ, let's let them be known. Because the good news is that God loves the world and sent his son to die for us. The good news is that those that believe in him will reach salvation and receive forgiveness of their sins. The good news is that the child of God that has never committed sin was considered sin because of us. He carried the weight of the entire world so that we who were guilty were, would be declared innocent. That's a marvelous news that the world needs to hear. Don't stay quiet, Christian Mission to Calvary. Don't hide the good news. The world needs to get out of the condition that it's in. A blindness in which they see correct their sin and their condition. Let's take them to the light. In darkness, you can't distinguish failures and when you err. But when everything is put out to the light, you will discover it. And the world, that's what does the world doesn't like about the gospel. But you and I were called to be a light, to let it be known, the good news of Jesus Christ. Please stand wherever you are. Glorify the Lord. It's a church of Jesus Christ that has the best news of the entire world. It's the child of God that has the greatest news. The world needs to listen 
to not motivational speakers, much less to news agencies. The world needs to hear the church announcing the good news of Jesus Christ. Glorify the Lord there. And if you can raise your hands, if you can be grateful with the Lord because he forgave us and redeemed us. It's wonderful what he has done for us. But he placed us in the position of being useful. He gave us the spirit so that we can be useful. He gave us his nature to be useful. Because we are complete in him, as the scripture says. And the spirit that we've received is not a spirit of cowardice, but in Jesus' name, cowardice leaves Christian mission to Calvary. Shame leaves. Timidness leaves. And today we repent because we have hidden the greatest news that the world needs to hear. We've been ashamed to let known the glory and the work of God in our lives. The testimonies of the work of God, more than being told in groups or in pulpits, in temples, should be counted in people that need to hear the power of God. I'm not saying they st you stop mentioning them within the church. But sometimes our testimony just stays with the congregation. Of course, it strengthens faith. It feeds the faith of the church. It's wonderful. But there are multitudes outside that need to hear that God that healed you, that God that provided for you, that God that has changed your way of thinking, that God that restored your matrimony, that restored the child that was lost in drugs and brought him to his kingdom. The God that was capable of changing that family member or friend that was a drunk and now he's a servant of God. The world needs to hear the reality of a real God, of a powerful God. Let's repent of the sin we've committed, of being ashamed of the gospel, of not showing it to others. I'm not speaking of feeling that we have of the gospel, because we feel proud of it. But hiding it is the evidence that we're ashamed, not talking about it, evidences that we're ashamed of it. Today we stand in Jesus' name, as Christian Mission to Calvary, to testify and announce the good news of Jesus Christ. And that it's written in the book of heaven that the word of the Lord grew and the number of the disciples were growing in the nations because Christian Mission to Calvary preaches the good news of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, glorify the Lord, exalt him. If you need to ask forgiveness, ask forgiveness. If you need to repent, do it in Jesus' name. But take the position of a church, but allow yourself to be transformed in your mentality of multiplication and ex in your mentality of expansion. It's not that you visualize a big number. Every big number that you visualize will continue to be short or small compared to the vision of God. It doesn't matter how big you believe the number you've thought of in terms of the multiplication of the church. 
because the only number, the only quantity that connects with the vision of God is inheriting the world and it's making disciples of all the nations. In Jesus' name, with your hands raised, glorify the Lord. Exalt his name. Exalta su nombre. Aleluya, eso es. Tuya es la gloria, tuyo es el poder. Por siempre y para siempre tú eres rey. Tuya es la gloria, tuyo es el poder. Por siempre y para siempre tú eres rey Tuya es la gloria, tuyo es el poder Por siempre y para siempre tú eres rey Tuya es la gloria, tuyo es el poder por siempre y para siempre tú eres rey Tuya es la gloria, tuyo es el poder Por siempre y para siempre tú eres rey Tuya es la gloria, tuyo es el poder por siempre y para siempre tú eres rey Tuya es la gloria, tuyo es el poder Por siempre y para siempre tú eres rey Tuya es la gloria, tuyo es el poder Por siempre y para siempre tú eres rey Tuya es la gloria, tuyo es el poder Por siempre y siempre tú eres rey Yours is the glory. Exalted is the name of Jesus Christ. Christian mission to Calvary. Glorifies. Exalts the name of the Lord. Powerful Lord. Victorious Lord. Churches, the villages. In the temples, in the homes, we glorify all of Guatemala, in the United States, in Peru, in Belize, in Honduras, El Salvador, and the nations exalting the only and true God. Tuya es la gloria, tu exalted be his name. Poder, por siempre y para siempre tú eres rey. Tuya es la gloria, tuyo es el poder. Por siempre y para siempre tú eres rey. Tuya es la gloria, tuyo es el poder, por siempre y para siempre Aleluya. tú you are eres good, Lord. rey. Qué bueno eres Dios. You are good, Lord. Qué bueno eres Dios. It's the time of the multiplication. Es el tiempo de la multiplicación. Time of the expansion of your church, O oh God. And today we stand up as a church that is obedient to your heart and to your word, proud of the God we have and the gospel that we preach, proud of a living God that's real and true that we serve.
In Jesus' name. Lord, thank you for what you're doing in all of Christian Mission to Calvary in this Congress. What a wonderful way that you've decided to glorify yourself. How glorious is your mercy by not letting us go. and determining yourself to fulfill what you promised among us. That your Holy Spirit continue to fulfill that work for which you've called us to. Not only working in our hearts and understanding and knowledge, but in our transformation and our determination of obeying the Lord, the Father. That today, it's not only a narration of a Luke writing what the church did in the past, but be the narration of the Holy Spirit fulfilling what Jesus Christ determined in the nations through Christian mission at Calvary. In Jesus' glorious name, amen. Amen. Blessed is the name of Jesus that the Holy Spirit continue to manifest himself in each life and that we keep enjoying his presence and his glory. But also in this time of refreshment, of rest, to continue and return with what God has for us in this Congress. So I send a big hug to Christian Mission to Calvary. Blessings.